talk a little bit about elephants in the, in the culture of Thailand. And it, I think one of the one of the things implied that elephants were originally used for lumber for lumber purposes. Was that the original integration in Thai culture? Is that um, well, they were used long before that, and um, as as pack animals to before we had trucks and things like that. Um, they used elephants all along the Silk Road. And then they use them in warfare. You saw some of the reenactments of warfare in there. They use them in warfare. And then they became kind of a, a novelty to royalty, and, and they still are. Uh, the king of Thailand owns a couple hundred elephants himself. Um, so it's kind of a status thing. They've, they've been a status thing for a long time. Um, when the logging industry in Thailand died, and most of it moved over to Burma, um, you know, now there's approximately 5,000 elephants being used in the logging industry in Burma. It's, it's enormous, but it's really hard to do surveys there because we have to sneak around with the cameras so they don't really let us in. Um, so that's really tough. But um, in Thailand, you had a lot of unemployed elephants after that, and, and moots with, with no jobs and no money and no education, nothing to do. And in came this, um, this rise in tourism in Thailand. And the dawn of elephant trekking, and that's just been growing exponentially ever since. There's about 90 trekking camps in Thailand now, uh, with over a thousand elephants being used all throughout Thailand. And trekking alone, there's less than a hundred out in the wild. It was the is lumber industry better on the elephants than the trekking industry, or is, is it equally? Yeah, it's it's hard to say. I mean, they, they go through the exact same training process. Um, you know, whether they're dragging a 2,000 pound log or carrying uh, 700 pounds of tourists, um, they're both pretty pretty tough work. I really, it's hard to say which is worse. I, they probably work them a little harder than the logging. I mean, they, they really do work them until, until they're dead. Yeah. It's, it's a, literally, they work them until they're dead. They, they, yeah. they would kill them or yeah. after Typically, males are used in logging, females are used in trekking. Uh, females are smaller, more docile, easier to train. Uh, the males usually have the big tusks, which are great for picking up logs. So Burma is full of big male tuskers for logging, and Thailand has more females for trekking. And the male tuskers will come across the border periodically. They'll bring them across to uh, desire, you know, to, uh, to breed with the females in, in Thailand. I guess where I'm going with this is that elephants are integrated into the culture and history of Thailand. Oh, yeah. So does that present another issue that it would present in, in, in a non-elephant culture sure. in the United States? We have pets in Thailand. I've got two elephants living next door to my house in Chiang Mai. Um, and they've been pets there for a long time. And there's a, there's a real big uh, gray area because there's a lot of people like myself that believe that elephants shouldn't be used in street begging and shouldn't be used in trekking. And the first thing these mahoops will say, well, then what we, how, do we, how do we make money to feed our elephants? What do you want me to do? These guys come from small villages. They don't have a lot of money. Their elephants are typically handed down to them uh, generation to generation. So their fathers are elephant keepers. Their grandfathers are elephant keepers. So this 12-year-old boy suddenly has an elephant that he has to take care of. You know, like we would have a dog here. An elephant eats a couple hundred pounds of food a day. So these kids, they don't really know what else to do. They end up in the city street begging. They end up in the trekking camps. And, um, and elephants, it's really interesting because elephants are, you know, they're revered in Thailand. As it's their national symbol. It's, uh, you know, it's a religious symbol. And, um, yeah, anti-euthanasia. They, they, won't, they won't kill an elephant. I mean, they're a very Buddhist culture. They do not kill. But they'll work the animal to death. Or they'll starve the animal to death if they're waiting for the ivory. So it's a really, yeah, it's, um, you know, their religion is full of hypocrisy, it's just like every other's, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a really tough situation. Is it true that the movies today love their animals? Like, we would love a dog? Genuinely do. Um, some of the movies are just rotten pricks. Um, uh, okay. Some of them genuinely do. There was some of the um, actually, in this last piece, uh, and I didn't unfortunately get to know him until later on, until the last day we were shooting. He grew up with his elephant. He spent 43 years with his elephant. They're both 43 years old, he and his elephant. And he was really excited about getting out of the trekking industry and bringing his elephant back to his own village and, and releasing his elephant and being with his family again and, and seeing his elephant in the wild. And I did see the love there. And I could see the relationship between these two that I haven't seen with other modes. 
So there are some out there that genuinely do love their animals, but they're, I think they're few and far between. I just wanted to say that he says that fully willing to work with a very well-known Buddhist and has no problem with it. Their religion that is hypocritical is also mine. What's happening with your film? Are you going on? To this is it. Did you hear about the plans of distribution? Or? Oh yeah, we, we have, uh, I mean, we're just getting to that, that point. This is our first screening. So uh, we have some distribution avenues that we're actually exploring now. Excellent. And we're going to have an educational version of the classroom as well. Great. Yeah. inform your friends and family about it because I found that whenever I told people when I came back to school and told my friends what I was doing and everything, they were immediately like converted and they said I'm never going to go to a circus again. So just by telling people you can make a difference. I think it's as activists, filmmakers, musicians, artists, the most common question we get by far, by far in our email box is 12 every day. What can I do? What can I do? The biggest, the biggest demographic segregator you can have as an activist is to decide that there are two kinds of people making an effort to make a change and that most of them are going to ask of somebody that they see as a position in a position of authority and experience, what can I do? And then there are select other people like Sean decided he was going to make earthlings because, you know what, best phrase, if not you, who? If not now, when? 